Thank you, everybody, so much, and welcome back. We're uh, here to kick off uh, what'll be a fun and fabulous discussion, I'm sure, on the topics drawing from yesterday, how we think about biology, and uh, as we experience it here on Earth, what does that teach us about what we might look for elsewhere and expect to see, and, and how would we figure that out, as well as given increasing capacities in the natural sciences and technology leading towards what we just heard about, uh, the building of cells, um, does that inform uh, our thinking about how to look for things, but also uh, guide us towards what we might uh, consider doing? Uh, so with, with that as a type of frame, uh, the first part of our, our discussion here is to hear from the panel uh, what they think about either of those topics or, or, or adjacent topics. And uh, I think we should probably go from this side down. Uh, Gary will be uh, co-moderating as well um, and, and, and set up for a free-for-all. But let's hear from everybody individually about what they're most uh, keen to share in opening up the discussion. And I'll ask people to say uh, briefly in their, in their opening comments um, a little bit about themselves and not a full bio. You can get that from the, the conference materials. I thought we were going to start at that end. I thought I was going to. We're starting right here. We just heard from Marilyn. <laughs> so the, uh, my name is Kevin Hand. I'm at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I study the physics and chemistry of ice-covered ocean worlds with a strong emphasis on Europa. And I direct JPL's Ocean Worlds Lab. And one of the big things that I focus on from a mission standpoint is trying to get a lander down to the surface of Europa scoop up some surface material and actually look for signs of life. And this is uh, an amazing mission that we are not yet committed to. We have the tools and technology to make it possible, but this mission is not yet uh, a commitment in NASA's framework. And when I think about you know, we spent yesterday talking about all the possibilities, and I think Dave Catling brought this up at some point, where, for goodness sakes, we can actually answer some of these questions and figure out uh, if these genomes have migrated, whether or not the origin of life is easy, whether or not the origin of life is hard, whether or not it arises wherever the conditions are right. We can actually go to a world like Europa and search for extant life. Why is that critical? Well, when you think about NASA's current program for searching for life beyond Earth, really the only place where we are pursuing that endeavor is the surface of Mars. And in that context, we're looking at very old rock. And I would be delighted if today or tomorrow the Curiosity rover turns a corner in Gale Crater and sees a stromatolite or, or sees some uh, bed form that looks like it could have been derived from life. But as we all know, we're not going to find large biomolecules in those ancient rocks. To really explore the fundamental biochemistry of alien life, we need to go to places where life could be alive today. And worlds like Europa and Enceladus and possibly Titan offer that potential. So I think we need to commit to getting some of these missions done. <laughs> oh, thanks. Good. Great. Uh, I, I'm Adam Merck, and I'm, I'm here. Um, and I, too, would like to go to Europa, personally, if I could. Excellent. So right. you wouldn't last long. You'd die. Well, um, I, I think that my argument is, is that just like any, we'd see life anywhere, we'd bring our own environments with us. The whole point of, and this is what I actually study, is I study how microbes survive in very diverse environments, and what we can learn from that so that we can assemble and engineer them to transform worlds. Now, I am focused, of course, first on us, but I run this thing, CUBES, which is the Center for Utilization of Biolog Biological Engineering in Space, which is meant to support a mission to Mars where we create a, an environment for us to survive on Mars <laughs> using biology um, for nine months, <laughs> mind you. Uh, and what I want to bring, what I'm most interested in here is what we need to do to understand what it takes for even a microbe to survive in these environments. And you have to remember, remember, there's 10 to the 30th or so microbes on Earth. 
And it was said earlier yesterday that anywhere you look for, anywhere you sample from Earth, there's life there. It's not exactly true, but it's almost true. Uh, for example, we've had teams go down 2.4 kilometers into a South African gold mine, break open a rock wall, and behind it, one single microbe, and it's phage, it's virus, <laughs> yeah. sitting behind there. Um, now, these are short programs that solve the solution of living anywhere, but they're not the same. There's not, they're not all the same. There's vertical descent, there's phylogeny, it all works, but each solution is different. So you have to ask yourself, I'm interested in, how would you know if I wanted to send something to some planet that only he could measure from afar, how would I know what I needed to send there so that it could form a foothold and take over, planetary protection officers aside. Right. <laughs> right. How could we send something someplace and make it take foothold? And that, that applies equally here. How do I put something into an agricultural field to support plant growth and have it survive there? And you know what? We can't do it. We don't know how to do that. Uh, we don't, it doesn't do, doesn't have to do with minimal life. It doesn't have to do with chemistry. It has to do with maximal life. The ability to sense, control, and change your environment. I'm interested in what is the minimum you know, we need to understand to create the, the ability to form a foothold in a new environment. Cool. My name's Don Goldsmith. I started life as a regular astronomer. I got a degree here and before long was on a faculty, but then I left more than 40 years ago to become an astronomy popularizer and to bring <clears throat> science and especially astronomy to an often diffident public. So the search for life is one thing that you can catch their attention with. I moved back to Berkeley. I even got a law degree across the road here. Still waiting my first extraterrestrial space law clients. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've tried to present all sorts of different things in astronomy. I wrote a textbook on the search for life in the universe with my late friend Toby Owen. And I have various axes to grind, but just from a personal and popular <laughs> point of view. I do see ever more deeply after this conference that finding the first extraterrestrial genomes is utterly essential. And, I see it as a major task before us uh, because, of course, the comparison of those genomes with ours will reveal an enormous amount, for example, whether we're all the same, whether there are messages hidden in the genome, whether our genomes were already sent by extraterrestrial civilizations, possibly as a challenge to figure out. Philosophically, I'm utterly opposed to what I just heard over here, <laughs> the idea of going to other, country, other countries, other continents, on other worlds and ripping them up for profit or for seeding them with our own stuff or for contaminating them with our own people. Uh, like most scientists, I like to think the idea of sending people to Mars is ridiculous in comparison to sending our wonderful automated spacecraft, which get better all the time, can do more and more, and in fact, make humans unimportant. Of course, as a popularizer, I understand. No Buck Rogers, no Bucks, as my friend Charles Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's my job, among others, and yours too, to educate the public that, and they do to a certain extent, admire our curi curiosity and spirit opportunity rovers on Mars. They give them personalities. We have to w work harder than that, at that. So those are my feelings. I only can say, go for the genomes. I only wish I can live to see it. I, I'm Mike Finney, um, and <clears throat> I have a, uh, deep roots in science and the biological sciences, <coughs> um, in, including as a college freshman being taught Organic Chemistry by Steve Benner. Uh, um, in spite of that, I stayed in, in science through graduate school. Um, but I ended up starting a company while I was in graduate school and then got pulled into the, uh, the biotech world. And uh, so now I'm an investor and board member of, an, of a, a wide variety of biotech companies, including a whole lot that are in the, uh, in the area of of upstream of DNA sequencing, of sample preparation and that sort of thing. So, um, so I, uh, I'm very familiar with the sort of technology that um, we would use to, um, to look for extraterrestrial genomes. So uh, years ago when Gary, uh, probably what, 30 years ago when Gary started talking to me about uh, looking for extraterrestrial genomes, um, I did the simple calculation of well, maybe it's not really all that probable, but name your probability and then multiply it by the coolness of actually discovering it, and you come out with a significant amount of coolness. <laughs> and so it's worth doing. Um, so I've, I've been, uh, been subscribed for a long time. Um, 
uh, I want to say a few things in defense of Mars. Um, whether you believe in uh, um, interstellar life transfer or just local life transfer, um, Mars is probably the, the most likely place in our solar system to find um, uh, life that's like Earth life, and that's what we're looking for. Um, uh, and especially, uh, it's especially likely for local transfer um, that whichever planet life started on, the other one would have been contaminated pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and then one more thing about Mars, which is maybe not so, really so much about Mars, but more about life. If Mars had life four billion years ago, Mars still has life. There, nothing has happened on Mars that would have wiped out life. <laughs> um, it's pretty dry there, but there's still some water. Um, it's pretty cold there, but you know, maybe it's a little warmer inside. And life is every, as was mentioned earlier, life is everywhere on Earth that you look. So if there were life on Mars, it has, it may have moved around, it may have got, gone into hiding a bit, <clears throat> uh, but it's probably still there. Um, so um, all that means it's, it, uh, it's definitely worth looking for. All right, my name is Jamie Kate, and I'm on the faculty here at Berkeley in the departments of chemistry and molecular and cell biology. And my background is I've always been very interested in catalytic RNA and the ability to this biopolymer that can both encode genetic information and also catalyze reactions. How's it able to do that? And so starting as a graduate student, I started using this approach called structural biology to get images of some of these, these molecules as they fold up in three dimensions. And it's, they're quite com uh, complex, as you saw from Harry Noller's talk, that's actually the ultimate RNA machine, the ribosome, and there's a lot of folding back on uh, the RNA molecules too. It's very different than how it folds when it's used as genetic material. And so from those kind of efforts, I, I learned how RNA can fold in three dimensions, and then of course, I wanted to take the next step, and I went and worked with, actually with Harry Noller to look at, at the ribosome itself, and I have an ongoing interest in how the ribosome can, can act as um, really a universal translator. So I'm sure most people here have seen Star Trek, and it has this wonderful kind of uh, device in the show to keep, the, keep things moving, a universal translator, so that the, you know, the, the actors can all, or the people can all understand each other. And in our biology, we actually do have a universal translator. We have this, this machine, the ribosome, that can take a four-letter code in, in nucleic acids and translate it into a 20-letter code in, into proteins. And that process is highly complex. The, the ribosome pictures that you saw yesterday are really just snapshots. This, this machine has a lot of moving parts, and these movements are coordinated. And, and it's a very uh, interesting thing to think about how that would evolve and how that works. In, in terms of um, where we're headed, we're very interested in, I'm a part of the Center for Genetically Encoded Materials, uh, NSF-funded uh, um, center, thinking about how we might take the ribosome to synthesize other polymers besides ones that use alpha amino acid monomers. And so this is kind of an engineering project. If we really understand the ribosome, eventually we should be able to, to, to engineer it to make other kinds of polymers. So in terms of thinking about looking for um, extraterrestrial genomes, I, when I started thinking about this, I thought, well, well, we first need to define a genome. What is a genome? And this, this came up a little bit in terms of thinking about when you, in the, in the mine, you go down and you find a bacterium and you find a phage, you know, are we gonna, what are we gonna find? I think phage are probably much more abundant compared to their, you know, the, the bacteria they, they infect. There's also uh, a recent discovery in the past few years of really, really small bacteria in archaea. And these are ones that, that Jill Banfield has found in almost every environment she's looked. And these are, these are microbes that are, that are about 200 to 300 nanometers across, which is extremely small. In fact, when you look at these by EM and tomography, you can actually count the ribosomes. There's like 30 to 50 ribosomes in one of these. So it's kind of wild. This, this, these, are, these are organisms that can replicate. Um, but what's interesting about them is they do not have a genome that encodes intact metabolic pathways. Many of these organisms have, in, have to rely on getting metabolites from the environment. And so um, 
we have phage, and out, we've recently worked with Jill Banfield to find what we're calling megaphage. These are phage that have hundreds of kilobase genomes, some of which encode ribosomal components. And so we're starting to see this continuum from phage to bacteria that don't have intact metabolisms to free living bacteria. And so um, I think you know, when you think about the definition of life, the self-sustaining system, these could be modular and interacting parts, and we, and we have to kind of be open to, to looking for all those parts. I will say, though, that eventually all of these things, if it's at least based on, on life the way we know it here, they're going to have ribosomes. And so we can be looking for those, and in fact, we could be thinking about that as a, as a target. Uh, I'm Penny Boston, and I'm the director of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Um, when I'm not being a bureaucrat, um, my real life has centered around uh, very extreme microorganisms, primarily in the subsurface for the last 25 years. Uh, earlier in my career, of course, I worked on surface extreme environments. But what I discovered when I first started uh, going into caves was that the total biodiversity of the subsurface is extraordinary. Uh, it's unparalleled. We have very few people who are working on those materials, and yet the biodiversity is staggering. So we go into one particular cave, and there may not be more than 10%, 15% of overlap with any other cave that we study, right? I mean, we, we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of the biodiversity because uh, our hypothesis for that is that the subsurface is highly partitioned in a way that the surface is not, and that the transport mechanisms that we have of wind or water and uh, animals moving around and so forth on the, on the surface of the earth uh, does not pertain to the geological setting in which these organisms find. And so there is a plethora of uh, continuous innovation, pruning, uh, loss, and gain uh, in individual evolutionary pockets, essentially. So this is not the way we're used to thinking about uh, the microbial world in general. Um, listening to people you know, talk over the last day, uh, it's very clear that um, we are um, highly influenced by the fact that we are surface creatures. And when we look at other planets, we are essentially, for the most part, focusing on the surface. Uh, now, we've been forced to not do that looking at the icy worlds because they uh, uh, are not candidates on the surface for likely life forms uh, in, in the radiation environment of gas giants. And so perforce, they're, in my view, essentially uh, water-filled, planet-sized, uh, ice bedrock caves. And this means that they're roofed systems. And when you look at a, a, an earth cave, you see that it behaves as a system. It's a miniature system. It has certain energy and materials flow uh, to uh, surface processes, uh, but that is constrained, highly constrained. And this is one reason why they're uh, good things to study. Thinking about the panspermia issue, um, as I have been for a number of weeks now, uh, as we, as we uh, came up to this, this event. I think that um, it is a very different set of challenges trying to look for um, exchange of biological material within the solar system than it is looking uh, for in inter-solar system exchange. Um, there are the obvious differences that people have already articulated here. But one of the important things is that for a natural um, system, uh, which may pertain to many other exoplanet systems, we ought to start scoring <coughs> solar systems on a solar system-wide basis, right? to apply it to exoplanets. There either will be life somewhere in the system or there will be no life in the system. This is enriched close to home where we can actually do interrogations of our neighboring planets and small bodies. But the complexity of trying to sort out the genetic uh, uh, pedigree and pathway, if we are so lucky as to find life forms on other planets in our solar system, is both a, a gift and a curse. It's a gift because it gives us a basis for comparison, but it's a curse because um, 
over the long history of our solar system, much true information about this is likely to have been permanently lost. And we know that evolving systems are highly responsive to their environment and that we have four billion years or something like that of evolution. And so when we look at microorganisms today, people tend to uh, mistake that for primitiveness. They are not primitive. They are the recipients of just as much evolutionary time as you and I. And this means that they have gone through bottlenecks and changes. And so even areas that we think are deeply conserved within the genome may have been the result of a bottleneck at some point in the antique past. So reconstructing the actual point of origin uh, in solar system genomes, if we're lucky enough to have more than just ourselves to study, I think is going to be an exceptionally difficult uh, situation. My only um, hope for detecting an extraterrestrially intended uh, purposeful uh, type of genome that would have been sent out by some other uh, intelligence is that it would have to be so engineered that it would defeat the normal stochastic events that happen uh, on a planet and the uh, way that a genome responds to that. So I see the only potential really for detecting uh, any evidence that we come from another genome as being sort of de facto evidence that that was an engineered effort rather than a natural effort because I think that natural panspermia, even if it's occurring in every single solar system all over our galaxy and beyond, is um, going to be erased because it is not built to last. It is built and optimized to change over time. You guys have heard from me. Go ahead. Oh, you first all heard from me. <laughs> no, I, I, obviously, uh, sort of the prospect of ever finding uh, a genome from somewhere else is extremely uh, exciting, and it will for sure inform uh, our project in all kinds of complete new ways. So that would be also for that reason really great. Yeah. So uh, in, in a few minutes, we'll go to the room for discussion, but in pushing it along, I want to I wanna ask the panel uh, three specific questions. So the first one, um, it started yesterday, uh, Gary, with your comments, and has been leaking out and has now become sort of explicit. It's, it's sort of a terrestrial, I'll, I'll phrase it as a terrestrial arrogance that, that if, if we're going to find life somewhere else at a fundamental physical molecular scale, it's going to kind of look like it does here. We're going to have a, a motor that makes energy. We're going to have a ribosome that does decoding. We're going to have a polyvalent backbone that's got some charges for persistence and base subs, it's going to kind of look like what we got. And, and I don't know if that's really the argument being made or not, so I'm trying to call it out explicitly. And, and if it is being made, is it being made because we think the physics is the same everywhere and that's creating the selective context within which these biomolecules have to work? And that's the gist of the argument? So is anybody, or do I have it totally oh. wrong? I, th I think you have it wrong. Uh, I, uh, we are trying to test one simple hypothesis that is very explicit, and that is that life um, elsewhere in our solar system is related to life on Earth. That is, they had a common ancestor. And the, f and the reason that we're looking for genomes is because if they had a common ancestor with life on Earth, then they will have a genome that is like our genome. If they did not have a common ancestor with life on Earth, then who knows? Um, I can't tell you exactly what, they, what they're going to look like. Um, and if, is it, are they going to have DNA? There'll probably be at least some pretty significant difference from what, we're, what we have. But, but we're, not we're not looking at that. We're just testing one hypothesis that is worth testing. I like to uh, call this the, the Huygens difficulty. Christian Huygens wrote the first serious book on extraterrestrial life, and he speculated, for example, that there was life on Jupiter that would be a lot bigger than our forms of life, because <laughs> Jupiter is bigger. And then he went on to say, and of course, they'd have heads because everything needs a head, and they'd have arms because they're very helpful for <laughs> gathering things in, and legs, you've got to have legs to move around with. And before he was done, he'd imagined a race of superhumans. Totally yeah, but, but, but hang on a second. I mean, we heard about ATP and energy, and so what's the energy molecule going to be? It, it, it's not the macroscopic, it's the microscopic. 
Gary, do you agree with this? Oh, if it's ancestrally related, it's going to be use all the nucleotides, they'll have the RNA. But world. what if it was a separate origin? Well, then Some... I got nothing to offer on that. Right. And I think that's <laughs> the challenge, is if it is a second gen. We embrace our example, ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's going to be very hard to, for us to detect something like that. Now, I think that S Stephen Benner had a, has a pretty good argument. If, if life arose in a polar solvent, it likely will have a polyelectrolyte type backbone then we can start to think about using analytical chemistry approaches to concentrate those, not necessarily get sequence information per se, but to start using things like mass spectrometry to look at what are the components of those polyelectrolytes. But if it's not like our, our kind of nucleic acid, it's gonna be a really challenging problem. But I think what, part, part of what you're asking, Drew, is, is you know, do, are, there, are there alternative chemistries we haven't thought about that could form the basis of what we call life? And, in your talk, you're talking about what your unit operations are to define life, right? And you said, well, I need something that provides power. I need something that uh, provides the ability to replicate. And then ultimately, someone brought up the fact that, that we probably want to be able to evolve a heraldical material, material that is not just the ability to self-replicate, it's the ability to change. And so whatever the chemistries are, they have to have the ability to encode information and to change that over multiple cycles. You know, and that, and that, and then to win. So there has to be ability to encapsulate, to, to identify one to the other. It has to be ability to encode information. So the question is, can you do that without a polymer? I don't know. Can you do? Can you, is 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 HP the only small organic or the only small molecule equivalent that we can get energy out of? And the answer is no. There's other ones we can do. Uh, and so I think the answer is that we don't know. It'd be, it's hard to imagine these strange things. But as you pointed out, as soon as you're in a polar solvent with organics around, it's really likely that, it, that you're going to get something like carbon-based life. Whether or not it's our carbon-based life, all bets are off. It's just that it's really easy to make heterogeneous polymers out of things like carbon and not so much out of, like, osmium. Yeah. <laughs> and there isn't osmium. Wait, what's that? And there's no osmium around. Too. Well, that's, that's the other problem, yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let me move on to a second question. So. Um, Adam, you were, you were hinting at and making the point that regarding microbes, it's sort of hard to understand what microbe is, is uh, right for the niche when you haven't seen the niche yet. And, yeah. and obviously on Earth, most microbes, you'll make the point we can't cultivate in the laboratory. We so poorly understand them. And then Penny's pointing out there's many different environments we might not have sufficient empathy for. Is it, is it really? So, so then the question becomes sort of the engineer's question. Let's admit, I don't know. Let's, let's presume I wanted, uh, popular problems notwithstanding, I wanted to put microbial life all over the place, and I know I don't know what those places are. Um, if I'm a gardener here on Earth and I've got a, a difficult plot of land, I'll go to the seed provider and I'll ask them for their monkey wrench collection, this ensemble of seeds that is purpose-built for ambiguity and difficulty. Um, can you not imagine the equivalent of, of a monkey wrench microbiome that works 99% of the time when it <laughs> lands on somewhere? You know, I think that um, we're all hung up on genomes because, you know, in the last number of decades, we've been able to analyze the heck out of them. But if you actually look at real microorganisms in real environments, they don't uh, live as individual entities. So the selective unit really is a microbial community which has many different strains. Uh, I, I sort of think of us as the uh, 2.0 model of biofilm, right? Uh, that biofilm and, and these microbial communities with their ability to quorum sense and uh, discuss, so to speak, uh, they have their own breakthroughs discuss uh, about how they meet the contingencies of the environment. Um, and then we sort of usurp that by being large, structurally complex, but in many cases more simple chemically. And so I would never send a single type of genome, I wouldn't send a single type of organism because species, the species concept breaks down horribly in, when it's applied to bacteria and archaea. So obviously I think we would send a whole community if we wanted to do that. Now, I, I want to break down the question into two pieces. So, so one is the fact that, you know, organisms create their niche. And one argue, you know, so, so one argument is, is that you actually need the community yeah. because each one's creating the niche for the other ones and so on. Right. 
and, and, and that's just a way of creating a stable object. So we are stabilized by the fact that we're multicellular and can control each other. Yeah. But in a sense, what Drew's asking is imagine that you are, uh, you know, you are a laptop computer being sent across the universe and you need to con you know, connect to your audiovisual systems and you, you have an HDMI connector and a, and a small HDMI that you can't connect, right? And so the question is what, what is, what is it we do? And so we talk in, 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 in you know, dispersal problems, in the universal dispersal problems, of things like, well, we, maybe a phage should be sent across the universe. Problem with phage, when we look at the, on Earth, we think about the compatibility of phage. They are very, very narrow spectrum objects, generally. Define so, phage for everybody. So, if, so a, phage, a phage is a virus that infects bacteria and archaea. Um, and so they're, they're predators of those, generally predators <laughs> of, of those cells. And they tend to be rather narrow spectrum, not all of them. Most, they, they, they need to recognize a very specific molecule on the surface of the organism so that they know what it is. And they need the very specific machinery of that organism to get their job done. And they're very, very, very dependent on their environment. They don't and eat. super abundant. And super, super, super abundant because their because their prey is super abundant. And and they've won in a way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> certainly, the, certainly in the genome number wars. But 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 but, but consider it. They're, they're, they are they they're, they're, their specific assumption in the world is that their prey exists in very precise configuration. It is exactly this thing. It has this lip A molecule. It has this op C protein. Inside it has this ribosome and this genetic code and so on. And not, not everything has the same genetic code. It's very close to each other, not the same. Uh, however, you take another predator, uh, Bedella vibrio. Bedella vibrio is a bacterial predator. It carries a lot of its information along with it, unlike the bacterium. It has a little bit more information about itself because it's a bacterium. It has its own membrane. It has its own you know, metabolism. But all it needs to know is that you're made of lipids. You have a lipid outside yourself. And once it knows it has lipid on the side of itself, it can get inside that membrane and just chomp whatever ATP you have. <laughs> and it's go <laughs> and, eat, and just eat, eat inside of you. It'll just grow as a berry inside of you. Uh, it's awful. <laughs> but the point of the value is that, is that it's very broad spectrum. It, it doesn't care what you are as long as you're what's called a gram-negative microbe, more or less. More or less. So the point is that there are guys who are broader host range. I can live in more environments than one, and ones that are narrower host range. So to Drew's question about, about what do I send, aside from the fact that I need to, have, I need to provide a seed environment for my, for, my, for my target actors, is I have to send guys who don't care as much about what they have to wor worry about in the world. So sending a Bedella Vibrio, which just cares if you have a lipid outside and you have energy molecules inside, versus a phage that says, I actually need exactly these things. I would send the video guy, but then I need a whole set of those. What if it's not lipids? What if it's what if it's a gram-positive world, and it's a protein on the outside? Or what if it's a uh, you know a crown ether membrane like a like a, a nano archaeota? You know, all of these different things are different constraints in the world, and you need a a toolbox that represents the the least physical barriers. You know, for whatever target it is, but um, for the most possible physical barriers that might exist. So. <laughs> well, her, her, yeah, her point was that the probiotics are many, generally many, the reason why you have more than one is so that le either at least one does its job, or the group together do the, do more of the job than any one does, does alone. If you're getting probiotics in there, you've got about 25 different bacteria. <laughs> yeah, but how many survive inside you? I don't know. And and so so the you probably poop most of them out. Yeah. So so the I so would the, send yogurt to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> personally. That's right. Yogurt, yogurt to Mars. Huh? Just a, well, one comment on the uh, uncultivatable bacteria. So it was a big surprise when people started uh, doing microbiology by genome sequencing, because you thought you would see things you recognized, and you did, but there was this huge underbelly of biology that nobody had ever gotten to grow on a bacterial plate. And, and it was a mystery. Like, well, it's, it's sort of the dark matter of the bacterial world. And, and then people started to assemble their genomes, and they realized that these bacteria you couldn't grow tend to have smaller genomes because they've deleted things that are involved in making vitamins. And it, it became apparent that if you just put E. coli on the background, so E. coli you can grow, and then 10% of the uncultivatables you could suddenly grow because they're getting what they need from the E. coli. So th this is a highly evolved system. In the same way that we demand vitamin C and vitamin B, we've seeded the production of vitamins to the bacteria. As, as animals, and, and only humans 
have seeded uh, vitamin C, right? It's, it's, it's not all animals that need vitamin C. So there, there's ways that you can sort of depend on your neighbors. And it doesn't mean that there's these intimate interactions between every microbe and another intimate. There's sort of gross community expectations. They say, I know I can get that from another. And it's more efficient for me to just get it from my neighbors. There's a lot of that in microbiology. But the thing to take home from that is that there's assumptions being made. Every organism is assuming yes. something about its world. So, the, yeah. so just to be fair, you know, Norm Pace, he's been, he's been mentioned multiple times in this meeting, so Norm, Norm was the person who really brought to bear this idea that 99% you know, of what we saw in the soil back in 1998 was uncultivatable. And Gary points out it's, it's now up to about 80% uh, of what's in the soil was un 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 uncultivatable. Not all small genomes. But part of the reason why is, we, is that the, all those guys make assumptions of the world in which they live in, and then we violate those assumptions when we bring them to lab. And, and we, we try to isolate them we try to single isolate strains, them. Right. which they hate. Because they're, like, they're like, well, where, where, where's, my, where, you know, where's the guy making this for me? And where, where's, where's, my, where's, where's this particular molecule I expect? And why can't I attach to anything? And, uh, and so again, it's this idea that since we don't know that, um, and since no one knows, if you're, not, if you're talking about projecting a you know, microbe from Elvis and Churi to here, like, I don't know what's on that. How would you know? There's a whole bunch of assumption built into these, these, these genomes, if you will. Uh, and uh, this is a good example where even on Earth, even in your cave, when you move from this level to this, this, this depth to that depth, the assumptions change and the microbes that are there. Oh, yes, it's absolutely. Different, yeah. Just one more thing. The, the bacteria hedge their bets by mating with each other. So, you know, we have all these different species in the tree of life, but that tree is, is a bit of a lie. Uh, because there's horizontal transfer all Total the time. Total lie. Yeah, well, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can I, can I, can I, can I hang on, hang on. Right. Well, let me finish the thought here. Just just finish the thought. So that <laughs> this idea that you can recombine between genomes means that it's a way for bacteria to suddenly, in a jump, bring in entire metabolic pathways that they need. And so they're constantly mating these things around. And it's a, a pan-organism. And so in that sense, you don't have to bring in one, you just have to bring in a lot. I mean, a, a lot. lot. Yeah. There's so much great science here. Let me just be a really dumb engineer for a minute. <laughs> I'm gonna put a, a, a payload on, on slingshot two, three, four, five, six, whatever, and, and can you get me a monkey wrench collection of microbes? We don't know where we're going, but it's gonna cover 90% of the things we encounter and boot up a habitat. Well, sure. I mean, you go to just about every extreme environment you can think of, and non-extreme environments, and you gamish them all together, and you send it off to, you know, destination X. I think you, you, yeah, I think you separate them. You don't gamish them all together. You, you keep what? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think you gamish them all together. I think you, you keep your Arctic communities, your Arctic communities, and your hot spring community, hot spring community. I'm not sure you do. Well, we could argue <laughs> about it. Just because Earth has not done that. Right? Well, well so, I, I'm going to argue that you're, you're going to disperse them anyway. You're going to disperse them anyway. But you the, are. But, the, but yeah. the, shock, the shock of having them together immediately is hard. But the resource you bring, that is the fact that you have to take that community and give it its assumptions so that when you seed it, there's enough of that assumption present. But its can assumptions can change yeah. because the assumptions are answered not by the properties of an individual organism, but they are answered by the entire assemblage. Right. And so, I mean, it's like the alien effect in this case. No. You know, you, you drop uh, uh, some, some strain of uh, microbe into an already well-established environment. They stand, for the most part, a fairly slim chance of being able to make it, right? Because it's not the individual organisms of any sort. It is really this community structure. Yeah, but that's sort of what, I, what I was getting at is that, is that I want to make, keep the community intact the one that you extract from your cave, mm -hmm. and the one that you, you, you extract from your hot spring, and the one you extract from your acid mine drain, whatever. And now you have a bunch of these tubes, all with these different self-supporting communities, and with the feedstock that they have come to assume exists. And now I have these ampules on my shelf of the, which are, which are like- Ampules would be yeah. hard. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. They're, 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 yeah. they're, 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 this is, this is the definition of a, of a community living in a cave. This is the definition of a community living in the ocean. This is the, you know, and then you could spread those, you know, you, you know, you, you could, you could mix and match them. They're almost, you know, and put them in a new environment. But the point is that they have a seed, a platform on which to grow, and then begin to evolve and adapt. 
So the analogy is like replanting a seedling. You don't just take the bare roots. You take it with a little bit of substrate. A little bit of substrate, yeah. So I just uh, want to want to pivot and cover one last question before we go full audience uh, free for all. It has to do with um, the last topic of, of, of the set of uh, discussions we've been having so far about biology. The idea that there might be messages here. And I'm nervous that one of the outcomes of bringing this topic up for discussion is given how much more sequence information we have about terrestrial genome, the only thing people would think about doing is I'm just going to look for more information in the primary sequence data. Given what we were just talking about and, and, and the wealth of knowledge we're just gaining about biology, if we imagine how you might code information or meaning into living, evolving milieu, how should we be thinking about that or setting up a conversation to figure out the different channels for communication that might be resistant to evolution as a biased noise generator that might overcome some of the other puzzles of interpreting a message? Anybody want to take that on? Just a quick thought that, you know, as much evolution has taken place, it has not erased the RNA world from the ribosome. So, you know, the RNA world was displaced in almost every way, uh, but the core part of biology still has that remnant. And so that's something that has resisted it. And is that a message? I don't know. Another way to look at it, I think, and I'll, I'll take, a, take a, a hint from that, which is that the message just might be we are here, and then what you're looking for is a message that is preserved that we are here, and that's an example of a we are here method, me message in a sense. We were once this thing. Did you guys see this article that came out last year on squid? And it was funny because it was 12 scientists, I guess, who said, you know, I think, this, I think squid have extraterrestrial origin DNA in their, in their genome because they look weird. And what they meant by look weird is that from a phylogenetic perspective, from a, from a, if you try to do the vertical descent of all these genes, they, they were away from a lot of other things. They were away from other things. Joe Banfield's CPR collections, not just all our Kyoto, but other ones, um, look away from a lot of the other things that we have sequenced. And so as a, pa as a pattern of, of evolution, you see these sort of jumps or left turns in the world. Now, in general, we can explain those. They're, not, they're, they're probably not extraterrestrial. They probably are terrestrial. But if I were an alien trying to figure out how, if I were trying to find a message from an alien, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a particular primary sequence. Would be some weird left turn in, in some evolutionary track, some pattern of behavior, some pattern of history that showed that there was an, a, an infusion of new information that was incompatible with Earth systems. So you take something like the production, the, the appearance of proteins that can work in oxygen, it correlates with the time in which the Earth was undergoing that change to an oxygen atmosphere. But if you suddenly saw that those things arose much, much before that change, and it came in sort of with a bad assumption, right? That would be interesting and perhaps indicative of, a, of an infusion from the outside. Other comments on that or hints or suggestions to a teenager out there who wants to start looking through databases? I mean, I think looking for messages and genomes is great. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the one it's much better than all the SETI at home horseshit that people did over the years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think this, this aspect, just coming back to the ribosome of, of translating from one kind of polymer, sequence-defined polymer, to a completely different one is, is pretty astounding. And um, it's, you know, it's observation, um, but if it's a message, I couldn't say that, but it is kind of, you know, why, why would life require moving to this kind of division of labor where you have these, this need for really completely different kinds of polymers? Thank you so much. At this point, we've got this fabulous roster of protagonists and intellect, and so we're going to go uh, to all hands. Wait, do you want to start the cube? Or? We want to start the cube. That's what I'm saying. To the cube. To the cube. <laughs> to no. the cube. No. Cube. I'm the chairman. I'll use the oh, mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My conference. Uh, the, uh, I've talked to some of you about this. I, I, I love all these discussions about Europa and Enceladus and, and uh, Mars, but uh, we haven't talked about 
my favorite place, which is Venus, the upper atmosphere of Venus. And I like your comment about, isn't that an interesting place to look? It's also an environment that, if there's nothing there, we might think about planting life there. Any comments on that? So let me take the Venus one, because I'm also a big Venus fan. Uh, I think there's the, you know, the question that we discussed uh, before in different venues about whether or not there's a um, self-sustaining native <coughs> Uh, cloud-based biota there. That's the modern application, really, of uh, the astrobiological significance of Venus and definitely needs to be interrogated, although you know that I think that the chances are low because of the dewatering of the planet. But I also think that there's another really critical aspect of Venus. Um, it is such a comparison to Earth in so many ways, and yet, you know, Earth is uh, relatively benign and Venus is anything but benign. Something terrible or several terrible things must have happened to Venus to give it the bizarre orbital characteristics that it has and uh, spin properties being so slow and retrograde. Um, but I think that the potential is there for trying to delve in to whether or not we could find any evidence for a clement um, biospheric period in, in, in Venus's ancient history. And from discussions um, from colleagues who actually work on Venus uh, planetary science, it's pretty clear that there uh, is a lot of you know, recent resurfacing. And we don't know the timing for Venus's great tragedies. It may have been very late in its development, in which case, uh, are there uh, stable isotope shifts within um, the materials that are still there, either on the surface or in the atmosphere, that might give us a hint of a prior biosphere. It's very hard to operate, as we all know, on the surface of Venus. So looking for physical fossils or you know, indicators in the rock is pretty challenging for us right now. But there may be you know, more broadly distributed uh, uh, geochemical, um, geophysical um, remains that might give us some hint. So I think uh, Venus has much to teach us, and it is definitely an understudied planet. should go back and forth on the questions. And once you speak into the cube, you're responsible to pass or toss it to the next question. So you have to find your next question. Thank you. Uh, so, so my question for the panel is, uh, I was thinking about Drew's question about, you know, will we expect life to have ATP synthase and other kind of these, you know, similar molecular components. And also thinking a bit about the smallest seed package you could have is, the question I had for the panel was, uh, you know, how different do you think life could look if it shared a common origin? You know, if it diverged at the RNA world stage or, or possibly earlier, you know, uh, would it look drastically different? Would we expect it to look the same? Are there any scenarios in which it would look so different we'd have a hard time recognizing it? And I'm yeah, just kind of interested in hearing uh, your, your thoughts on the question. Thank you. I mean, it, it, the RNA world hasn't been erased from our genomes, amazingly, right, to me. So if we have a common ancestor from the RNA world, I would expect them to have ribosomes uh, that uh, are similar, but they could be sort of more divergent. If they use RNA as an informational molecule, the RNA world did, then you can make copies of it and you can do use genomic technology <coughs> to look at it, even though it's not yet to the DNA world. but. Again, my, my view would be that what's transferred is full-on, highly evolved, the bacteria we recognize, but it would be an analogous tree, right? It would be a tree that was different enough to not be in our tree, but still rooted with our tree, having some of the same protein sequences that everybody shares here. If it's very, very divergent, there's a point at which we can't recognize it, and our genome technology wouldn't work. What do we do if we successfully somehow manage to eventually get through the ice crust of uh, Europa, for example, and discover, yes, there are um, life packets there of some sort. <laughs> I don't even want to call them organisms. And suppose they have ribosomes. Are we going to conclude that those are related to us, or are we going to uh, instead advance the hypothesis that because ribosomes are so super fab wow fantastic that they would have arisen because they're the best of all possible ways to make 
a functional and information I, I would molecule. Ne I would never expect a, a convergent solution from an independent origin. If you find a yep. ribosome, okay. it is, you would, it's, it's, would, a co it's a cousin. It was a cousin, okay. Yeah. That's an interesting question because I think this, we may face this. We may face this, you know, just because it would be made out of carbon, well, heck, the whole universe is stuffed with carbon, right? Uh, so the, the carbon nature is not very significant, but a ribosome yeah. meets the metric for being specific enough. I think and it's, it's not a candidian interpretation where the ribosome is the best of all possible molecules to do this, and of course it would arise everywhere. Can't so, yeah. question for Jamie. So, if you were going to spread life around the galaxy, would you try bacterial communities, or would you think about uh, self-replicating ribozyme systems as, as an earlier, more flexible form of communicating living systems? Oh, I'd certainly want to start with something that's already highly evolved to yeah. survive. Why? Be a, well, because it, we don't even know how to, how to make our own kind of self-replicating system. Precisely. So one program is to figure out how to do that first. Well, we heard a and bit about then, that earlier. And then uh, move from there. And it but, could but be why, why that would another. That be, why would that be more robust? Uh, we already know that the life that's here displaced that. So, uh, well, but, but David's point yeah. could be this, is that you start with, again, it's, 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 it's reducing the number of assumptions. And so if something is very self-replicating and all it needs is one chemical substrate to be able to do its job, yeah. and, it, and it has the, pop, 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 the, pop, the possibility not just to self-replicate, but to, but to make errors in that replication, which is yeah. one of the key pieces. You're, then you have a, you're playing you have a numbers a, game, right? You, you have a yeah. long transit, and you're going to be subjected to radiation. You want a system that actually uses that as fuel to keep exploring the space along the way of possible self-replicating systems. Oh. We're, we're not trying to, we're, not, we're trying to seed a, a process that will eventually involve. We expect it to be replaced by something that is more customized to the environment in which it lands. But you want to boot the, you want to boot the system up. Right, but that, that's interesting about intentionality there, because one, one intention of that could be, yeah, I just want to see life across the yeah. universe. You could say, actually, I'm going to wait a long time. The, um, do you boot your computer with DOS 1.0? <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, it's analogous to, you know, wanting to grow a vegetable garden, but starting with liverworts and hoping for the best. I mean, it sort of depends on how much time you've got to waste yeah. waiting for the results of your experiment. I mean, I, I do Oop. think that there's one interesting aspect here in terms of the engineering part. We do have all of these millions of DNA sequences that encode proteins of all sort, pathways. And so you can imagine that, yeah, maybe we need a, a microbial community, but we could engineer components into that that may have never been right. conjoined right. in nature, but because we have the information, we can put these things together for the An first time. An engineered community. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, our ability to do genome engineering is just taking off now. It's, right. you know, the ability to design whatever we want. Uh, so what's it going to be like a thousand years from now? Exactly. Imagine a civilization that's a thousand or a million years more yeah. advanced than us. Would they be sending bacteria or would they be sending engineered quite human and photosynthetic humans? <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted well, to thermophilic. It depends on the goal, right? Do you, do you want to replicate what you've got, the sophistication that evolved in your planet, or do you want to just seed the universe with something that can become something fundamentally different? All right. Okay. Uh, who else is, who can yeah. I toss this to? Uh, I got, got, a, got another dumb engineering question. Um, there are no long, dumb Long time ago, questions. I did uh, uh, counter cracking and uh, network security. Uh, speaker yesterday, uh, lady speaker mentioned uh, eukaryotes invented sex and death. Uh, speaker this morning mentioned finding a bacteria gold mine in South Africa and its phage. So predation, does predation, predation precedes sex and death or sex and death responses to predation? Does predation always emerge? And if it's so, doesn't, wouldn't that make uh, panspermia, you know, the message in a bottle, wouldn't make it self-erasing? Thanks. What was the last part of your question? Wouldn't it make does it, it make, does it, well, the, 
the message that you're looking for doesn't make it self-erasing. In other words, yeah. we it may have been there once, the but yeah. there's a predation. It's yeah. So it's interesting that you know earlier, um, I think it was Peggy talked. Oh no, no, it was Gary. It was talking about how, how bacteria have, have sex. They don't really have sex in the same way that, that a eukaryote has sex. They they are much more promiscuous in their in their way. They don't care where the DNA came from. They don't care if it was situated to itself as we are to a fungus. They just care that the back, that the gene got there. Well, they're kind of bipolar on they are, they, they, because right, they protect right. themselves and then they let it in. And they're right. they're let very. It, uh, yeah. But it, but the but the they evolutionary and the, and the evolutionary time scale, they're very promiscuous um, for these things, and they also yeah. are very inventive, much more inventive than we are um, per generation in terms of new 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 genes and things. So you have to understand that even in a jar of microbes, if I take a single single microbe, a single one with a single genome, and I put it into a little little one mil beaker, and I just let it sit on my desk for a day. In there, there are now a whole bunch of new little organisms, all which are derived from the original one, small mutations. And each one of those is in competition with the other, right? They're competing for space. They're competing for food. Are they predating on each other like a phage predates on a, on a, on a, on a, on a host? Not necessarily, but they are certainly one's going to win. The phage, on the other hand, is dependent on its host. And so in the case where you're pro just one base pair different, and that much better at eating glucose than you are, your progeny will destroy you, and you'll be gone. If your phage destroys you, it's gone, right? So predation and, and competition are the nature of any changeable system with finite resources, right? Whoever wins, wins. The, the second piece is a bit more complicated, because they are, it's, just, it's about how change occurs. And sex was a way of allowing change to occur in a more controlled manner <laughs> than we do in, 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 the, in the bacterial world. Well, and it's more whole hog, so to speak. It is more whole hog. I yeah. mean, you just <laughs> smash two things together and you produce, you know, a third gamish of all of that. Where if, you know, you're a bacterium and you're accepting a plasmid, uh, these are little bite-sized chunks, yeah. right? Much, so, much smaller. It, so the, the sort of diffusion rate is much more dispersed within the microbial world than it is we large things. Although when you look at our genomes and you see all the trash that's in there from everybody else, we're not as discreet as we think we are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The eukaryotes, which is us, we're a DOS 1.0. <laughs> <laughs> We've had many it's, fewer generations than they have. They were, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and it's really a kludge. It's a <laughs> terrible kludge. Aww. Aww. <laughs> it's true. True. <laughs> I have a, a question. So I, I did boot DOS 1.0 and even before that. Um, <laughs> some of us are old enough to remember that. So uh, it is possible to survive that era. Um, so m my question is the following. There, there are organisms known on Earth who were recently discovered, which are you know, radiophilic. They are really quite um, much more able to use uh, radioactive uh, uh, elements uh, and their byproducts than we thought was possible. Is that really true? I think it's the radioactive uh, hydrolysis that releases the hydrogen. They're not like slurping up. Well, I guess it's, that's part of the, the question yeah. here, the, because you're, you're the expert. So I, I'd like to understand, you know, it, has there been a, a concerted effort to look at those organisms which would actually make use of extreme environments, whether it's um, you know high energy particles of which we would have many on a, a journey, or low energy ultraviolet, lower lower energy ultraviolet, um, and it's things that we consider to be highly uh, dangerous, um, but yet they may be the sources of, of you know energetics, and you know in fact in some ways it's been I think quoted many times, you know, cancer is vastly more uh, efficient as a life form than is what we consider to be, you know, a normal sense of life. So anyway, just wanted to get your comments. So, you know, in my view, cancer is basically uh, a single-celled lifestyle attempting to reassert itself, right? It's a, it's a rebellion. It's a rebellion against the uh, discipline of being a multicellular, uh, highly specialized group of different cell destinies, right? Um, in terms of uh, these sources of energy that we don't know of any examples on Earth that are using, I think that uh, my sort of half-assed uh, explanation for that in my own brain is that we're not on a planet where 
we need to do that, right? So for our particular sun, we have a huge amount in the visible spectrum. And uh, chlorophyll, uh, you know, rose to use that, it's effective enough and it has no competitors. If you were on a planet around a star uh, that had uh, much more uh, proportion of its, uh, if, of its uh, emission in ultraviolet wavelengths, and that was the only game in town, or you had a, um, an atmosphere that selectively transmitted those wavelengths but somehow kept visible out, uh, I think you might see it pushed in that direction. But the truth is we know so little about Earth's various organisms, we don't even know if there are some out there that could use UV, for example. I mean, it's interesting because I always would ask that as, you know, a question on an exam when I was <laughs> teaching. Um, you know, in terms of the um, uh, radioactive sources of energy, it may be that they're just too energetic for our kind of chemistry. Or it may be that we just haven't looked in the right places. I mean, where would you look? I would look uh, deep, you know, into the crust in areas where we had metamorphic core complexes with lots of radioactive elements in them. Um, I can assure you I don't know of anybody who's systematically looking for those. So we are um, unaware of those examples now, but I don't think that's conclusive that they're not here somewhere as a, playing a minor role. That's in one suggestion. So there is a black fungus that was collected from a what down fungus? a black fungus. Oh, a black fungus. That was that was it's still in the fungus. So it was collected from the the core of the of, of the Chernobyl melt meltdown, which is cryptosporidium or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we don't why it's black because it has a large amount of melanin produced. And there's at least one group that has proposed in a peer-reviewed paper, such as it is, <laughs> that that this can in fact capture that radiation and transfer the 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 you know the broken, the, the electron ejected by the broken bond after the hmm. uh, after photo capture by melanin hmm. and transfer that to NADPH and therefore hmm. drive metabolism forward. Hmm. Um, and so they call it radiotrophic. It's the only example that I know that someone has a mechanistic understanding of why that might exist. Why that might exist. Right. Yeah. Um, I think Peggy is exactly right. You, it, these are all would be lithotrophs of some sort or other to be down subsurface or in these extreme environments. Um, but it, this has not been proven. Uh, but at least we have at least some hooks we could probably look at to see if it, if it, if it were so. Um, I, I got to mention, one of my favorite experiments in all of biology is a yeast experiment. I wish I could remember who did it. So, somebody here might know. So there's a gene called SPO11 that's needed for breaking chromosomes so that they recombine with each other in, in organisms that have chromosomes. And so without SPO11, the yeast is dead, but if you give it strong cobalt-60, it, it rescues the lethality. And so this is, this is an organism that requires massive amounts of radiation to be alive. Wow. It's just quite lovely. <laughs> I'll take a, a, a little bit of a different tack on your, on your question. Um, if Europa does have life in its oceans, the radiolytic processing of the surface ice may actually help to power yeah. that ecosystem. So Europa's ice is bombarded by about 125 milliwatts per square meter of charged particle radiation, energetic electrons, ions, protons. And that creates hydrogen peroxide, sulfate, oxygen, all sorts of very useful oxygen. And one of the challenges that we have with these ice-covered ocean worlds is that uh, tidal energy, which sustains the ocean itself, may provide an incredible flux of reductants from the seafloor, a la hydrothermal vents. But completing the biochemical battery requires uh, the oxidant. And on Europa, even though radiation can be a pain in the neck for the engineers, it may actually be very valuable for any life forms below because you produce, we see condensed phase oxygen with telescopes uh, on Europa. And so if some of that radiation-produced oxygen, sulfate, peroxide, et cetera, gets conveyor belted down into the oceans, now you're creating a, a redox gradient that life could harness. So it's not radiation a la what, what you're asking about, but it is a very intriguing possible ecosystem. And by some calculations, uh, much of which I've done, 
you could actually get enough oxygen into Europa's ocean to sustain not just microbial life, but also multicellular life. Uh, so the, I think that's a kind of a good segue to the question I had, and the discussions have been interesting. Of if you were going to look then for life in Europa's ocean or one of these other places where we think might harbor life, and there are uh, functional macromolecules like ribosomes, and there are ultramicrobacteria that appear to be really common on Earth, and bacterial cells, what would you look for if you were going to actually go and get a, look for physical evidence of life? You mean operationally? I mean, if you could get to the fluid, I would um, filter the heck out of it and look and see microscopically, microscopically first before I did the chemistry. You want to see cells, or do you want to look at? I want to see some. I want to see structure with chemistry associated with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the bag of suspicious chemicals is um, not enough for me. That's uh, you know circumstantial evidence. Um, Everything that I can imagine, even if it's radically different from the life we have on Earth, is um, unique chemical processes going on inside some kind of structure that gives you a boundary condition where you know entity from non-entity, right? I think that the boundary condition at some scale is absolutely essential. So structure uh, is, is a real clue. And then if the structure looks interesting, then you look for the chemistry. If you are stuck with doing chemistry first, you just try to look for suspicious chemistry. But then, to me, it's not very convincing unless you find a structure within which that chemistry is uh, forming. Just make DNA and sequence it. You, know, you, can, you can detect one sperm. It's very, very, very sensitive. So you just. So that's so monospermia. Right? So it, <laughs> the way people do survey, how do you survey for life on Earth? You, go out, you make DNA from wherever, the mud that you're studying, and you sure. ask what's there. Yeah, but Gary, you're so DNA right. biased. Absolutely. You and I have had this yeah. debate before. So the Penny's answer, the, the uh, uh, and this sort of comes back to something that, that Jamie mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I think there's a big difference between being able to use instrumentation, make measure, measurements, and know that something is there versus understanding it. Yes. And so I think we are primed and ready to be able to make the measurements to know whether or not something is there. And if it's there in great abundance and uh, fecundity, then perhaps it'll be uh, easier to understand. Uh, if we were to go to Europa or Enceladus and see complex organics, uh, amino acids uh, bound together, et cetera, some morphology, uh, then we would follow that up with a, uh, uh, with a more complicated mission that could potentially do some sort of sequencing. You're crazy. Now, now Gary, it's just, now Gary it's wants to send a, a sample. not look for DNA. I, I don't think we're saying not to look for DNA. I'm just yeah. uh, thinking that. No, but you're, you're saying that maybe your eventually you should go straight to DNA. So, so, so there's a backstory here. <laughs> Gary and I have debated this for a number of years. <laughs> uh, he, he wants to put a DNA sequencer on a Europa lander, which is great. But every gram costs us a... a yeah, no, I understand. Of, you're right. A so, bajillion dollars. <laughs> and the key there is that any given measurement that we commit to has to have scientific value even in the absence of life. Yeah, that's... And that's a key that is, that's the truth. That's that we true. learned yep. on Viking. And yeah. it's not... What would we learn with a DNA sequencer on Europa if there is no DNA-based life? We would learn that it's DNA-free. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. not, not maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you know, your chemistry yeah. has to be looking chemistry has to work. Yeah, yeah. I do like the idea of looking yeah. for structures, structured kind of objects, yeah. and, and to filtrate patterns. Yeah, patterns. Yeah. And they structures. should do that at crime scenes too, right? You should just look for structures, and then eventually look for DNA. No, they go straight to DNA. Because we know right. there's going to be because DNA they know there. that the, 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 the criminal is like the human, right? I mean, it's a very simple thing. They, they know so much about it at that point, yeah. they're willing to invest. You should get a cop on your advisory board. <laughs> if, the per, if the perpetrator doesn't have DNA. We've got another really question over here. Yeah. We're going to go to the next okay. question. This is great. Keep going. What I've been getting from this absolutely wonderful panel and from the previous talk is something which is equivalent to what we've been dealing with in astronautics and SETI for a few decades and that is called the von Neumann machine. Yeah. 
the von Neumann machine is basically, for those, if there's anybody in the room who doesn't know this, it's a robotic device. You send it out into space. It comes to another star system, duplicates itself. In 20 million years, the entire galaxy is filled up with our von Neumann machine. Now, you're talking about bacterial devices like this and packets of bacterial or viruses or what have you that could be fit on very, very small spacecraft, even those we talk about in Project Starshot. They already have. They, I know. So within a very few decades, we will have the ability to project these things through the solar system and possibly beyond it. Do we need some type of ethical control? Because I can see a university, university like Berkeley or I am at Cooney making the decision, hey, let's go out and pollute Proxima B or Tau Ceti 4. Uh, do we simply allow that or do there's, we There's already that? rules against it. Yeah. Who, right? who would apply? Planetary protection, right? Yeah. Kevin, you could it's probably so, talk all about planetary protection. Well, it was interesting listening to all this talk about the right phage, the, the, the uh, what was your term, the monkey wrench packet. Um, I spend a lot of brain cells thinking about how to make sure we don't do that. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Europans should be for the Europans, Enceladus should be for the Enceladians, uh, and you know, Europa, Europeans. You know. <laughs> uh, and of course, as Carl Sagan said many years ago, Mars should be for the Martians. Uh, now, the human exploration program may uh, leapfrog that, but certainly when it comes to Europa and Enceladus and Titan, we have very strict uh, guidelines, both uh, within NASA and within the, um, uh, the Coast Bar agreements, to make sure that we don't bring any hitchhikers. Uh, and so, uh, I don't necessarily, I think ethically it is very important to consider the, yeah. the microbial von Neumann machine, yeah. uh, but at least for our survey of the solar system and seeing whether or not extraterrestrial genomes actually exist elsewhere before we seed them with our own, I think we need decades of exploration okay, at a minimum. But, but let me simply continue, if I may. I wasn't talking about a NASA launch mission or a Japanese government launch mission or any national right. organization. I'm talking about the fact that within a few decades, uh, the way solar photon sale technology is developing, this could be done by a university. Or please, a please group, don't do it to or, Europa or, be, or Saladis. Or, 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 or it could, could be done by, by <laughs> WikiLeaks could right. do it for crying out loud. <laughs> How do we deal with this ethically to prevent that? I mean, you're absolutely correct. We have to, but I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Um. Boy, I don't think we know how to do it either. Uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that we're going to stop exploring and having these oh, ideas right. until we somehow become better creatures, because right. we're really pretty damn far away from that, yeah. being primates to begin with. Um, you know, and we we're not very good at coming up with ethical solutions and then implementing them, except in arrears, maybe. Could I add something there? That, that we're quite aware of this. We're quite aware that this is, a, uh, is an issue. So over the next year or so, we're planning a couple potential workshops, like uh, smaller than this one, but uh, that will begin to sort of understand people's thoughts on that. Yeah, it's important. So I think it's a very timely, timely question, and it's one that that, uh, I mean, as noted, uh, you know, these are government rules. Uh, you know, they're embodied in the Outer Space Treaty, but, it, you know, I, I had an argument with the, you know, I won't mention any names, the CEO of SpaceX, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, the, uh, and, and I asked him about, you know, Mars for Martians, and, and he was rather dismissive. So, uh, you know, I think it's a, uh, you know, this is something we do need to consider, and, uh, you know, hopefully, it, in whatever role we can play in the foundation we want to try. Yeah. We can't even agree to avert a, a global climate disaster. How are we going to <laughs> agree on something more esoteric? Better talk about it than yeah. not talk about it, though. I'm, I'm just going to slip in before Natalie. There is a really good reason to send a sequencer, and that's to make sure that you don't have contamination from Earth organisms, which is much more likely than the fact that you're going to find an organism elsewhere that is sequenceable by a very specific sequencing mechanism developed for terrestrial life. Yeah, that's a great point, Lynn. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I, sorry to change the topic a little bit. Um, Penny, you said something earlier that impressed me, was when you look at other planetary systems 
and you're looking for the propens about the propensity for life, you want to look at the planetary system collectively. And the yeah. way that we do that when we're talking about remote detection of biospheres is uh, looking at the planets in the habitable zone, right? It's the most right. simplistic version. Um, but hearing you guys talk about subsurface life and your comment about caves on Earth, it made me wonder, you know, in the solar system we don't see any evidence of a global biosphere, you know, that's remotely detectable. But Except I'm wondering here. if you could have enough subsurface life to alter the equilibrium chemistry of an atmosphere that could be remotely detectable. Can you even imagine such a scenario? Well, yeah, I can actually. Uh, okay. But I think that the protection of it would be very difficult. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the exciting, the excitement over the icy world stuff that Kevin's been talking about uh, is wonderful. But how do we apply that to other solar systems is very difficult unless it was a very robust biosphere that had a significant leak rate yeah. um, okay. you know, from the subsurface of an icy moon or even from the subsurface of a currently apparently quiescent biosphere if Mars had one. Um, you know, certainly there's not enough stuff coming out of Mars uh, for us to even decide that there's something under there by you know, these uh, methane detections so far are still highly debatable. And, uh, so I think it depends on which kind of subsurface. If, if there's a subsurface biota on Mars, um, I have divided our solar system into type one and type two uh, biospheres. <coughs> we are a type one biosphere driven from energy from the outside because we are in the habitable zone. Uh, but what about icy moons that are getting their energy and warming sources from these tidal uh, interactions? It could be that the solar system, uh, you know, has more evidence of life, and it could be that those kinds of icy, um, sort of secondary habitable zones around gas giants could be very common. And I don't know how to detect that unless they are really a uh, moon-dominating event. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! The computer really went down. Really close. I was I was a field hockey player, not a, a volleyball player. Um, <laughs> still disastrous at beach volleyball. Um, Penny, I want to return to something you said in your opening remarks, uh, which was the idea that perhaps some early genetic seed, RNA or a precursor to it, um, arrived here from. Um, in t sort of an intelligent design perspective that some alien might have programmed it to try to evolve and hopefully eventually become us. Um, and you pointed out rightly that in order for that, uh, I guess in order for that to work, the, the evolution of intelligent life would have to be very likely given the stochasticity, stochasticity of Darwinian evolution. Yeah. Um, I think from, from some popular reading I've read that in mitochondrial DNA, certain base pairs are more likely than others to mutate over time. And if you trace back, or if you look at differences in populations of mitochondrial DNA, there's certain, certain parts that have more mutations among a large population than others. Could, so for the geneticists on our panel, could this line of inquiry be used to probe what parts of the of the human genome are more resilient to evolution and trace those back and through the tree of life? Well, I, it, mitochondria are formerly free-living bacteria, we think. This was Lynn Margulis's great insight in terms of how eukaryotic cells got built. So here again, I think that Maybe that's, I mean, <laughs> how many people have signed up for 23andMe, you know? Uh, that mitochondrial line is very significant, but it is very late in evolution for us. And I can't think of something comparable, really, within the bacterial and archaeal world. I mean, we have these, uh, we have these chunks of genetic material that are highly conserved that point to things like, um, you know, uh, early adaptation to a 
uh, a high temperature environment. But is that really primitive? I, I think that we just are up against this wall of loss of information when we have a hysteretic system that depends on sporadic, episodic, whatever events that cannot be predicted. And you know that's presumably common on all planets. So, you know, quick, quick, quite additional, no. quick additional comments, and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah. So two, two more folks. Yeah, so I'm just sort of following up on that. I think Gary mentioned this maybe that there are when we can use the sequences of all the different organisms that we've sequenced, we can identify a few hundred genes with so a gene level things that are that are conserved or robust. Um, but that's also I think probably there's a lot of loss along the way because there's more than one way to solve some of these problems that organisms are solving. But, but I will say that, that, that you, to your question directly, and this is how David does his work, is we look, we, we group the regions of, of DNA into types and, and, and we look to see how, how they evolve over time and they can evolve faster or slower. And that, so each piece of the genome evolves at different rates. And so you can see efflorescences of, of um, functionality that occur in temporal order, not unambiguously because of what you said. Sure. Right? But we can see those changes in rates. And there are certainly examples in the bacteria, for example, in the delta proteobacteria, a clade of bacteria, they invent, for reasons I don't understand, they invent histidine kinases at extraordinary rates. Whereas in the gamma proteobacteria, not so much. I don't know why, but it just happens to be a class of a class of function that goes much much faster. And if you look at the tree of those, of the, the phylogenetic tree, if you compare them, how similar are they? In that in that group, it's just massively moving faster. And so we can see that there's something about the environment that they live in and their lifestyles that is encoded in that. But we don't know how to decode that yet. <laughs> it's part of our job. Great, thank you. So we're going to wrap up with a binary question. We'll go down the panel. <laughs> from Marilyn to the end here. The question is, indisputable evidence of a second origin. Will we find that here on Earth, either because it's here already or sent here or we make it? Or will we first see it somewhere else? So here or there are your options. And what do you think? A second origin, indisputable evidence of that. We're going to find it here or there. Here. Can I, I isn't say nowhere else? a choice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What else? What else, Mary? No, I, it's just a question that came up while listening to this uh, discussion because you were talking about, you know, it was going to be difficult to find forms of life that don't depend on external energy but internal energy because it doesn't leak out. So, is it possible that we have a second form of life on our Earth that depends on internal well, energy that we don't know about? <laughs> Then we will find it here. I would well, say. Paul Davies has suggested that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have to have, uh, sorry. Perfect. So we Later. have. We have. Yeah. Well, now we're going to modify the closing okay. question. You have one. You have to communicate back one and a half bits. <laughs> here, there, or nowhere. Evidence of second origin. Here, there, or nowhere. Start over, Marilyn. Oh, here. Here. Nowhere. There on an exoplanet. There. 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 So that's solved. Here. Our work is done. <laughs> uh, yeah, I reluctantly say here, just because we don't have a rigorous program of exploration really searching for biosignatures beyond Earth within our solar system. That was more than yeah. a bit and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you got your point across. So yeah. thank you, you all very much. You didn't give us a time scale. That's all right, all right. right. <laughs> Ever. Time to first occurrence distribution. Thank you for your participation here and following online. I, Gary and I'd like to thank all the speakers who traveled to join uh, yeah, in great. the last talks. And, and please return in this room at 1230 sharp. That's when the next session will start. We go to lunch now on the fourth floor. So you can exit up to the elevator to floor four. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>